Good afternoon, everyone. Chris Green, the History Chap, uh, jo joining me now for uh, another live history session. Uh, so uh, I hope you're all very well. Greetings to everyone who's already putting notes in the chat where they're coming from. I can see Leslie, South Carolina. Uh, great to have the American contingent with us as usual. Uh, who else have we got? Uh, QA Library. You're down, I think you're down Portsmouth Way, aren't you? Um, but you're looking at what you're saying there in your comment. It must be in that part of the world. Uh, oh, I'd like to know more about the history of our wonderful host, Chris. How have you amassed such an incredible amount of knowledge? I'll address that one later on. I can't do Yeah, but uh, Jen, Jen Ingle, hello. It's not raining here in Cumbria. Good God, Jen. You better get out and sunbathe fast. Uh, Sarah Jane as well. Lovely to see you on the call. Um, and it's not raining here in London at the moment. So it looks like, and, and funny enough, no, it's not raining here in uh, in Worcester. Uh but, you know, every Friday for months, we've been talking about the blinking weather, haven't we? But uh, so welcome, everyone. And by all means, please, uh, this is an opportunity for you to join in with the conversation, unlike my normal videos. So kick it off with starting with, you know, just put in where you're from in the world. Um, and let me just tell you a bit of intro. So um, what have we got? Well, it's been a mad week. I've actually got uh, I've got, had uh, managed to get out two videos this week on YouTube, two podcasts. I've also done a, a live talk as well, live in-person talk at a uh, at a group here in Worcestershire, uh, which was great fun. So uh, the live, uh, the, sorry, the videos, if you haven't seen them, we've got the HMS Birkenhead disaster that went out on Monday. I'll put a link to that right at the bottom of the description below. And also last night, um, the story, there's more to this story than the ship. And I'll leave it at that. But fundamentally, it's, it's about the Windrush, the Empire Windrush, which is sort of gone down in history for one voyage in a 24 year, uh, 24 year history. Uh, she went down for one voyage, bringing uh, West, Indian, West Indian immigrants to, to Britain, to Tilbury in 1948. And really, I, uh, it, was, it was actually someone here on YouTube that said, you know, there's so much more to this story than of, of the Empire Windrush. Um, so I started doing some research and absolutely mind blowing. Watch the video. Uh, I appreciate some people think they know all about the Windrush. There are some people, of course, who don't necessarily buy into the whole Windrush generation and Windrush story. So start my video, watch the opening 30 seconds and decide whether you think I am purely going to be talking about West Indian immigrants arriving at Tilbury in 1948, because there's so much more to the story than that. Starting with the fact it was never a British ship in the first place, it was a German ship, actually had a role in the Holocaust. Somewhat ironic, role in the Holocaust, role in multi-ethnic Britain, the Tsar. More importantly, it was a troop ship from the whole end of the Second World War, actually, during the Second World War, of course, it was a troop ship for the Germans. It's a troop ship for the British after the Second World War. Uh, brought, carried a hell of a lot more British servicemen and their families to and from the Far East and the Middle East than it did bring uh, Caribbean immigrants to Britain. In fact, it only ever made one trip to the, excuse me, to the Caribbean. So whilst they're called the Windrush generation, and I explained a little bit about that in the video, numerically, the Windrush brought diddly squat immigrants to Britain. So there you go. And on that ship, there were a group of immigrants from another country as well. So there you go. So um, uh, so those are the two. Obviously, I've got two podcasts out, so you can watch, listen to them if you're in the car or whatever on Spotify, Apple. They're the two big uh, ones that seem to carry my podcast, but plenty of other people do. But um, so there you are. And as I said, it was really good to have... Um, to have a uh, uh, go and do a real live talk this week as well. And that one was completely different from the Empire Windrush or the HMS Birkenhead disaster in the 1840s. This went back to Anglo-Saxon England. And it was, I told the story of Ethel Flade, Lady of the Mercians, war, England's unknown warrior queen. Uh, an incredible sister, a daughter of Alfred the Great, sister of Edward the Elder, King of Wessex, and she was in charge of the Midlands of England. She ruled it in her own right for eight years. And she led English armies, Mercian armies, against the Vikings, no, most notably at Tettenhall. She captured Leicester. She captured Derby. The, the, the Viking kings of Jorvik, of York, submitted to her. 
And amazingly, she passed her, th when she died, the Witan of Mercia made her daughter the Lady of Mercia behind her. And that is the only time, this is a great one, hey, only time in English history that a woman has passed her throne down to her daughter. It's never happened, never happened since. Uh, Mary, Mary uh, and Elizabeth I were sisters or half sisters. Mary, Mary the third, uh, Mary, Mary the second, William and Mary, who we're going to talk about today. Uh, they, uh, uh, her sister. No one else. Victoria passed down to a boy. Queen Elizabeth II passed down to a boy. Uh, a mo amazing moment in Anglo-Saxon history. Didn't last long. Edward, Edward the Elder had had enough. He wanted to be king of uh, or rule uh, Mercia, bring it into the Project England, and uh, the uh, the daughter of Ethelflaed of Mercia was whisked off to a nunnery in Wessex. And there the history records stop. So there you go. So I, I find that period, of, and I find so much of English history really fascinating. And in fact, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about that in today's uh, in today's live. OK, so um, for those of you who don't know that uh, this is a little bit more of a relaxed ramble opportunity for you to join in with the chat, I will throw questions into you. So it is not one of my normal standard videos. So if you want one of those, then please go over to the channel and watch one of those instead. Um, but this is this is more like being in a pub or well, being being in my room now. So uh, so lovely to uh, to lo so lovely lovely to join you all. Uh, that sort of housekeeping. So shall we crack on? And uh, let me just quickly see who we've got here though. Uh, -da -da we've got uh, rainy Cincinnati. Oh, I'm glad to see the Americans have got some rain and not the Brits. That's great. Uncle Heavy, uh, Blustery Northamptonshire. Blustery is good at this moment in time, isn't it? We'll, we'll take Blustery. <laughs> British equals chat equals weather. Yeah. Uh, where have we got Norway calling. Wow. And someone said the Birkenhead and Windrush. Great videos. Thank you very much indeed. Strangely enough, the Windrush run, I, it, I, I put, that was the expression, the cat amongst the pigeons. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, I've had taken a bit of flack for that one, actually, from people. Oh, God, not the Windrush again. I thought I was actually going to get flack from supporters of the Windrush generation saying I, I was belittling the importance of, of the, the Windrush voyage from the Caribbean. Far from it. haven't had any of those at all. Uh, but I have had a fair few people who've made comments like, uh, shame it didn't hit an iceberg and things like that, which is a bit sad, really, because that's not where I come from in life. But there you go. Each to their own, hey? Each to their own. Um, South Africa, Claudio, nice to see you as well. Uh, History is often stranger than fiction, says Leslie. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I've got a question. Let me make a note of it, actually, uh, on here, on my little pad of paper. I'm going to ask you if you're watching a programme at the minute. Not just you, Leslie, everyone. Uh, Jorvik Viking Centre in York is well worth a visit. Yeah, really good, actually. Um, yeah, enjoyed that. Oh, I like your, um, sorry, I don't know your name properly, but OC2Fish07. Um, I'd love to come and speak at your college. So if you're interested in having that conversation, and that's, this is to all of you, actually, of course, I, I do go out and do proper talks, as it were, real live talks, sometimes with slides. Uh, some places I go to, I've been to a couple of uh, women's institutes, they don't have the technology, and uh, I just talk like I'm talking now bring history to life in the way that historically storytellers did around campfires. They didn't have PowerPoints or anything like that, did they? So um, if any of you would like me to come speak at any organisation you're involved with, then drop me a line. Don't do it here because I lose this at the end of uh, the live for discussion. Don't say it in the chat. Pop over to my website, thehistorychap.com. There's a, a link again to that down in at the very bottom of the description here. But uh, go there and drop me a line through the, I think it says uh, speaker. There's a tab called speaker. There's also a tab called con uh, contact me. Do either of those and we can take the conversation from there. But I do get out and about around the country. Uh, from people like Claudio, I'll always come to South Africa as well. We've just got to try and make the sums, the, the, the numbers stack up, haven't we? Um, where are we at? Lots of thoughts about. Um, thank you very much indeed. That's really good. Um, question, would I consider guest speaking on cruise ships, says David Webb? 
Yes, I would, is the answer. Got a couple of friends who do it, or friends, colleagues, shall I say. Uh, Rob Kasky, actually both from South Africa. Rob Kasky talks about, uh, he does a lot of Antarctica stuff, and he talks about Shackleton and Scott and Umwardson. And he sent some cracking photos back from Antarctica. He nearly got stuck down there when COVID broke out and the world went into lockdown. That was an interesting story. And uh, Dean Allen, also based in South Africa. Dean has recently been doing some tours up and down the coast of Africa doing lots of talks, just been in Mozambique, actually. So, yeah. so the answer, David, is yes. And if you've got any contacts, again, um, get in touch with me through through the website, OK? Um, yeah, I agree with you, David, regarding the comments. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, how much of my viewership is from the Caribbean? Virtually none, I would say, uh, QA Library. Uh, might change, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, very few, very few. Numerically, Caribbean is not a big area, is it? Uh, most of my most of my folks come from. Uh, it, 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 most of the time, UK is the biggest uh, viewer base, followed by the US. Sometimes, on particular videos, the US goes top. Third place is always the Aussies. Aussies, you get about ten percent of my viewers are from Australia. Just behind them are the Canadians, uh, and then we've got a sort of a, a mixed bag of uh, New Zealand, South Africa, Republic of Ireland, Germany, and then the Philippines interestingly. So there you go. So um, I will answer this question now, actually. Uh, uh, Platonic, you've asked, could you just pop in to the 80th Regiment uh, Museum in Staffordshire? I think you can, or the Stafford, sorry, the Staffordshire Museums. Um, I think you can. They're based near Whittington Barracks in Itchfield, from what I remember. Stand to be corrected. But um, the, you know, certainly the Staffordshire Regiment is, and I'm guessing stuff regarding the Battle of Intombi when the 80th Regiment, who became part of the Staffordshires. So, but have a look on the website. They're on Google. Just Google the Staffordshire Museum, uh, or Staffordshire Regiment Museum. It will tell you. I think, I actually think they are open and most of these museums are open for you to go into, okay? Uh, normally for us. Only a small fee, sometimes a donation. But um, so uh, hopefully that answers your question there. But well, with it, I haven't been there for some time, but I do want to go back up there and I also want to visit the National Arboretum, which is not far from there as well. Try and do it as a bit of a day trip when Sarah allows me to. Um... <laughs> Thank you very much, Uncle Heavy, for your comment. And Edward Wheeler, hello to it from Oklahoma or to Oklahoma City. Right, let me tell you some of the events that happened in British history this week because I've been waffling around and answering some of your questions. So, um, in running order, in date, date, date order, as it were, seventh of April, seventh of April, seventeen thirty nine, we have uh, uh, Dick Turpin is hanged in York, famous highwayman, and we're going to talk about him in a little while. Okay. 8th of uh, April, 1898, we're into a bit of military here. The Battle of Atbara in Sudan. This was between the British or British and Egyptian forces and uh, the Mahdist forces, no longer led by the Mahdi. He was now dead, but the Khalifa who ruled e Egypt, uh, sorry, Sudan, uh, he was his successor. A victory for the British, quite a decisive victory for the British and uh, under Lord Kitchener or Herbert Kitchener as he was at the time. So, um, uh, yeah, and I've done a video about that. Again, there's a link in the description below if you fancy a bit of military history this afternoon from the Victorian period. Uh, where are we at? 8th of uh, April, 1904, the Entente Cordiale is signed between uh, Britain and France, sort of bringing together uh, the, the alliance that was going to bring them together into the First World War. And it sort of end ended uh, centuries of rivalry, well, there's still a bit of rivalry now, isn't there? But centuries of rivalry between uh, France and and England, and then later Great Britain. And whilst the British had sort of been with the alongside the French in both the Crimean War and indeed in the um, the Second Opium War in China, storming of the Taku Forts. Uh, if, for those of you who watched those videos of mine recently. Uh, um, Britain and France up until this period were still at loggerheads. We'd only just, only six years before, five years before, had the Fashoda incident in Sudan, where after Kitchener had won at Atbara, he then went on to defeat the Khalifa at Omdurman, Battle of Omdurman. And in the meantime, 
the French had sidled into what's now South Sudan and had set up a, a established a camp at Fashoda, really trying to claim Southern Sudan for the French Empire. And Kitchener went down. There's a bit of a face-off, and uh, the the French under Captain uh, Major Marchant uh, Marchant uh, backed off. But the, there was a moment where you know the press on both sides of the English Channel were really sort of whipping up fervor about a potential war. So a major about turn, and really it was driven by. <laughs> Self-preservation and politics, no great love between Britain and France. Uh, the British realised after the Boer War that they were pretty isolated, didn't have many friends. Um, starting to get concerned about German ambitions under the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, and they really needed some, they needed some friends. Uh, First Alliance actually had with the Japanese. Funny how history turns out, isn't it? But they had the Japanese, and that was principally to release some of the Royal Navy from the Far East. If the Japanese, their ally, could could patrol uh, the Pacific, uh, that meant the British could bring more ships back to, fundamentally back to defend Britain, should the Germans go on the offensive. Uh, and then, and that's how they sort of realised that they needed to get into bed with the French as well. Um, the French were in exactly the same position. They were starting to fear the Germans, and they were already ally allied with Russia. But they felt that a British British naval presence in the North Sea, bottling up the German fleet, would be very helpful indeed. So, as I say, not a lot, not a lot of love lost between the two nations. And I've been reading a book, Line in the Sand, recently, uh, all about uh, the British and French in the Middle East after the First World War, carving up, creating what's now Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, and the French creating Syria and Lebanon. And the, the level of distrust between the English and French, or British and French, should I say, in the, the 1920s and 30s, unbelievable, unbelievable, considering that they'd been allies in the First World War and they were about to become allies in the Second World War. Uh, the distrust was absolutely incredible. So um, a, a great book to read as well, by the way. I haven't got it behind me because it's still by my bed, but uh, A Line in the Sand, um, great book if you'll know about uh, some of the roots of the modern Middle East. So interestingly, I said it, it had been you know, centuries of rivalry. Lovely segue into the next event this week, the 9th of April. 9th of April, 1413, Henry V is crowned King of England. And well, if we just say Henry V, Agincourt, I think we can just left, leave it there, can't we, as to the old English-French rivalry. Uh, but there you go. Henry V was crowned on the 9th of April, 19, uh, 1413. Same date, 9th of April, very different year, 1747. Uh, Lord uh, Simon Fraser Lo Lovett, Lord Simon Fraser Lovett is executed at Tower Hill and beheaded at Tower Hill. And I'm going to be telling his story in a little while too. So uh, brace yourselves for that one. Also, uh, a couple of others actually, the 9th, the 9th this week, you know, some, some weeks there are just you know, days where lots happen and the 9th of April is one of them. 9th of April, uh, 1806, Isambard Kingdom Brunel is born, probably the greatest British engineer. And I seem to remember when they did a poll nearly 20 years ago now, BBC did a public poll, Greatest Britons. Churchill won it. King, Isambard Kingdom Brunel came in at second place. So, um, and interestingly, this week, actually, um, on the 7th of uh, April, can't remember the exact date, but uh, uh, the Great Western, his ship, the Great Western, was launched. So uh, a good week for Isambard Kingdom Brunel, really, isn't it? Birthday and a ship launched all in the same week. Uh, we've got another ship launch. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, it wasn't launched. Beg your pardon. SS Great Britain set out on its maiden voyage. Beg your pardon. Uh, and we've got another maiden voyage in a moment to talk about as well this week. Uh, and then we've got two battles on the 9th of April as well. 9th of April, 1917, the Battle of Arras in the First World War begins. And on the 9th of April, 1940, the Battle of Narvik in Norway begins. And that really is the beginning of the debacle in Norway, the British and French debacle in Norway, a German invasion. Interestingly, of course, that neatly links into my video about the Empire Windrush last night because she was a German transport ship. Well, she wasn't. She was a German cruise ship that had been commandeered by the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, and she transported German troops to Norway in the invasion of Norway in 1940. And here we have 9th of April, 1940, the Battle of Narvik. And really, it was the, the fallout from the Battle of Narvik, uh, which 
end up as a as a German victory. The fallout of that was debated in the Narvik campaign was debated in Parliament in Britain in the House of Commons, and that is where basically the House of Commons turned on Neville Chamberlain. And um, was it Leon Amory? I think quoted Oliver Cromwell with a great line of you know in the name of God go uh, for, for your country go. Um, and Churchill was who had actually masterminded the Narvik campaign as for Sea Lord was conveniently absent from the house. And the rest is history, as I say, that was the fall of, of Chamberlain. So it's amazing how these events all get like dominoes, isn't it, history? You know, we don't always realise it at the time, but when you look back, you, you can see the sequence of events and that's part of the sequence of events. Uh, let me quickly just see what else is happening before I continue with events that happened this week in British history. Uh, but we've got, uh, we've got a maiden voyage, we've got another battle. Uh, what else have we got? We've got coronation, uh, oh, another battle. Yeah, and uh, an interesting religious debate as well there. So where are we at? I picked up a few things there. Hello from Oklahoma City. Hello from Rainy Shrewsbury in Massachusetts. Uh, don't know Shrewsbury in Massachusetts, but I know Shrewsbury in Shropshire. Beautiful town. So, seen in my first rowing victory. Just got to say, I um, actually picked up two medals that day. There you go, Shrewsbury Regatta. Ooh, uh, tight little course. Um, um, Ole Larsen, Antarctica. Antarctica is Scandinavian uh, or, or Norwegian specifically, I think you mean to say there. Um, well, obviously not by uh, international treaties, but uh, you could, uh, yes, win a claims at all. I'm sure the British, had they got there first, would have probably laid claim to the whole of Antarctica if Scott had won that. Um, not quite sure what that one's about. Dick Turpin was hanged. He was indeed. Yes. So we'll come to that in a moment. All right. Did they call it Palestine or Transjordan? Uh, both, Sarah Jane. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, that wasn't Sarah Jane. I beg your pardon. That was that was Oli. Um, <laughs> Sarah Jane, I love your comment about high women. Maybe I'll do a story about high women at another stage. But um, hello to you, Charlie. Uh, da -da 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 what defines a battle compared to a skirmish engagement? Um, <laughs> the local tourist board, Jen. Uh, uh, debatable. I think we all know when you do something like Stalingrad, it was a battle. But exactly where does a, a battle and a skirmish, where's the fine line? Um, arguable. I don't think there is actually any specific which says that. But if anyone knows otherwise, please, please put it in the in the comments. OK. Um, Lionheart, great comment about the Battle of Arras. Thank you. And Charlie, thank you very much indeed for your uh, for your comment about the Windrush. You missed my my earlier lamenting that I've had one or two flax uh, on a on a reasonably racist front. Um, hello from Worcester. Hello to you too. Uh, great to see. You. I hope that's that's Worcester here in Worcestershire, not Worcester over in in New England. Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Always happy about Narvik. There you go. Uh, skirmishes happen within and around main battles. Possibly, Char Charlie. Not sure. Um, I guess the skirmishes could be, you know, if a platoon of men meet another platoon of men out on a patrol somewhere. Uh, would you call it a battle? There was a... I know in the Civil War near where I used to live in, in Cheshire, there was... Um, uh, the, the, they always there was a, an encounter at Tiverton, just south of Tarpoli. Um, real small troop of horse on both sides, few shots fired. I think a couple of men injured. Uh, that's classified as a skirmish. Interestingly, Poic here at Worcester, uh, it wasn't much more than that, but that's classified as the Battle of Battle of Poic, first battle of the English Civil War, as some people would call it. So really don't really don't know. Um, Michael, what have you missed? Not a lot. A lot of me chuntering, and I've started to go through uh, started to go through some of the dates this week in English history or British history. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much indeed for a few, a few more people putting in what they think a skirmish is versus a battle. And um, yeah, I, I don't think there's absolute a, absolute um, def definitive in British military history or indeed in world military history. But um, 
<laughs> and you were going to talk about uh, Poic as a battle. Yeah, there you go. But that's that's Worcester, isn't it? You see, um, we all we all like to dig big things up. But um, right, let me uh, continue with what's happened in British history this week. So, tenth of September, eighteen fourteen, the Battle of Toulouse in the Napoleonic Wars. It was actually the it wasn't actually the very last, but it was the last significant battle of the Peninsula Campaign, of uh, the Peninsula Wars campaign under the Duke of Wellington. By now, uh, the Peninsula War campaign had been so successful under the uh, Duke of Wellington, he had helped push uh, the French out of both Portugal and then Spain. And now Wellington crossed the Pyrenees and defeated the French at Toulouse in France itself. And this was in 1814. And at this same moment, the, the Russians, the Prussians, the Austrians were lining up and starting to come across the border in what's now north, northeastern France, sort of that bit from, from coming from Germany. You know, uh, French people, I know you hate the English, but you really need to keep looking that way, don't you, really? Uh, but even if it isn't the Germans, you had the Prussians, the Austrians and the Russians coming that way. And really, it was the pressure on those two things. You know, the, the, the British were in the south of uh, southwest of France. Uh, massive uh, coalition armies coming in from the northeast of France, and Napoleon was forced to abdicate. That's where he went to Elba, and of course it was what his. He escaped from Elba less than a year later, and came back to France. And for a hundred days, he was emperor again, until he was defeated at Waterloo. So uh, that's where the Battle of Toulouse fits in. So, ah, oh, here we go. Tenth of April, nineteen twelve. RMS Titanic sets out on her maiden voyage. Uh, I, I, um, Titanic is one of those ones. I'm not going to go into it now because you'll be like, oh, God, you know, the Titanic. How many of those can you find? Titanic is a little bit, I'll be honest, a little bit like Empire Windrush. OK, there's the obvious story. You know, it hits the, you know, it hits the iceberg and lots of people die. Um, there are so many other stories within that. And... Uh, here's just a couple, okay, on passengers. Oh, actually, yeah, two passengers and two about the crew. Uh, and then a personal one, maybe. Uh, two pa two words about the passengers. Did you realise that um, there were, I can't remember the amount, there were loads of nationalities re represented on the Titanic, okay? We had Chinese, we had Russians. Uh, interestingly, by the way, uh, the films, if you ever see the films, okay, all of steerage is full of Irish people, Okay. Interestingly, the biggest contingent in steerage were not the Irish. They were actually uh, the Swedes, Swedes and Norwegians, Scandinavians, uh, were the biggest group in, in steerage. Um, so I thought, just uh, you know, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Just how history and the narratives are told, that it's all about, you know, it's, you know poor Irish in, in, in steerage. And, and most of the Irish who were on the Titanic were in steerage. But... Poor Scandinavians were there as well in bigger numbers. Uh, interestingly, uh, e almost in the same numbers, were actually English in steerage or British in steerage. Um, they, they were there in big numbers as well. OK, so that's one. The other one is it's really interesting that there was a village in Syria. No, sorry, beg your pardon. Um, yes, yeah, Syria-Lebanese border. And this village, a whole group of young men were going to America for a new life. And most of them perished on the Titanic. But um, so that's a, it's an interesting one that you know people from the Middle East were immigrate emigrating even back then in the in 1912. Two stories about um, uh, members of the crew, just to keep you uh, little tidbits that you can put in for your friends and family this week. Actually, at Cherbourg, the um, the, the the Titanic basically set out from Southampton, 10th of uh, 10th of April, um, uh, 1912. Uh, she went to from Southampton across the English Channel to Cherbourg in France. Uh, she picked up some people there. She then went to Queenstown in Ireland. She couldn't actually get into Queenstown, so she was uh, just uh, just off, off Queenstown, but went to Ireland, picked up said Irish uh, immigrants, and then set off across the Atlantic. And as I say, the rest is history. Interestingly, when she got to Cherbourg, one of the crew was actually put on a disciplinary and was kicked off the ship. <laughs> that has got to be possibly the luckiest sacking anyone has ever had. And I just, I just got these visions of this guy rocking up back in England, and you know, absolutely getting an absolute 
earful from his from his missus that he'd been sacked from the Titanic. And then about five days later, it's like, oh, that wasn't such a bad thing after all, was it? So um, the other interesting thing was that uh, none of the officers who survived the Titanic were ever given a captaincy of a merchant naval ship. Most of them stayed at sea for the rest of their careers, uh, but none ever got, uh, one was given a captaincy of a Royal Naval ship in the First World War. And interestingly, one of them, uh, Lightholler, the most senior officer su to survive, actually had a little motor launch, which he took over to Dunkirk. He was one of the small ships uh, at Dunkirk. And I think that might be a great story to tell, actually. Interesting. Any of you who've seen um, Nolan's film about the uh, Dunkirk, the one, the recent one, which is like, mm, I'm not sure, sure. I sat through it, and at the end of it, I thought, you know, that's a couple of hours of my life I'll never get back. But um, if you remember, there's a guy there who takes his boat across, and they, they did model it on, on Lightholler, supposedly, so on Lightholler's story. But uh, imagine being one of those soldiers at Dunkirk, and a little boat comes up, and it's like we've got some really good news and bad news. You know, Good news, we're going to get you off the beaches and take you back to England in this little in this little boat. Uh, bad news, <laughs> it's captained by the bloke who was on the Titanic. But there you go. So uh, the Titanic's maiden voyage on the 10th of May, uh, 10th of April, hello, 1912. Um, oh, by the way, yeah, it is a fun one for you. 10th of April as well, going back in time, 1633. The first ever bananas went on sale in England. There's <laughs> one bunch of bananas. They were brought from Bermuda, which would, had only been established as a British colony about 10, 15 years beforehand. Uh, and this bunch of bananas were brought uh, to a man called, um, I think it was called John, John Johnson. Um, I think his surname was Johnson, certainly. And he had a shop, um, like a grocery shop in Holborn in London. And he put these bananas on sale. First time they'd ever been put on sale in England. And now in Britain, we consume five billion bananas a year, which I think means every single person in Britain has has to have some like 100 bananas a year. Uh, so assuming that there are some people who hate bananas and some little kids who can't eat bananas and some people, you know, don't have a lot. That means some people are, are eating their body weight in bananas, probably. So there you go. Yes, we have no bananas. Thank you very much, QA Library. Uh, and let me just finish off and then I'll come back to your comments. Okay, so where are we at? Um, 11th of April, 1612, the last heretic is burned at the stake in England. Going to talk about that story in a little while, so I won't go into that in any more detail now. Uh, 11th of uh, May, April, sorry, I don't know why I'm going into May for any reason. 11th of April, 1689, William and Mary are crowned joint monarchs of England uh, in 1689, uh, uh, or as we tend to know them as William and Mary. But, um, but there you go. Uh, um, 12th of April, 664 AD, earliest date in our in our little trawl through history uh, this week. Uh, 664, 12th of April, uh, the Synod of Whitby. Significant religious meeting and convention in Britain. I'm gonna tell you that story as my first story in a little moment, okay? And then just rounding off the week, we have the 13th of uh, April in 1868, the Battle of Magdala in Abyssinia. A British victory storming the fortress of Magdala that was occupied by the Emperor of Abyssinia, Ethiopia nowadays, um, Emperor Theodore, and uh, he committed suicide. He was, he definitely was on the slightly, um, let's call it, uh, I'm going to use the word mad. I'm sure I'll get shot down by someone for that. But he, he certainly was, uh, cer certainly was not a, um, uh, how do we call it, well-balanced individual. Not that, that in not what the British need to invade because of that, but uh, partly actually his ac his actions didn't help matters. But anyway, so that was the British invasion of Abyssinia, uh, really to rescue some uh, British uh, diplomats and others that Emperor Theodore was holding uh, as hostage. He would sort of seized them, imprisoned them, he hadn't just seized them, imprisoned them in his fortress at Magdala. And uh, the British launched a major invasion of the country purely to rescue them. They weren't interested in conquering Abyssinia. They you know, rescued them and then they cleared off out again afterwards. So uh, uh, a really good. Uh, it was probably one of the most logistically sound 
military operations the British conducted during the 19th century. Uh, and interestingly, one of the leading generals, not the leading general, one of the leading generals, uh, two, two actually came, uh, Frederick Roberts, the later Field Marshal Lord Roberts, Bob's Roberts of Kandahar, he was there, uh, but he, more senior than him in the Abyssinia campaign, but as I say, not Top Dog, uh, who was Napier, was the main man, uh, was um, uh, uh, Frederick Thesiger, who carried off his duties incredibly well. Unfortunately, Frederick Thesiger then went on to become Lord Chelmsford, and you might know him because he didn't carry out his invasion of Zululand quite so well when he was the main man himself. There you go. Sometimes it's good to be a number two, isn't it? No naughty comments. Thank you. As I said that, realised. Uh, Banana, is, this is the fascinating little snippets that make my channel so interesting. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully I've got a few good stories to tell you in a moment, just going into a bit more depth. Because one of the things I love, you know, I do love British history in the sense that, and it's only because I live here, but 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 um, because I live here, um, I'm just fascinated. You know, why are roads called the names they are? You know, why is that plaque in that church? What's that pub named after? Why do we have some of the sayings that we do? And I've got a history of a saying coming up in a while, and it's all about laughing your head off. Okay, so um, let's just quickly look over here. <laughs> Sarah Jane wants a banana sandwich. Edward Wheeler's father for his fi final combat mission in 1945. This week, in fact, this day, 12th of April, 1945. Um, that's a cool one. Um, hello to, from Maryland in America. Oh, Lionheart, you've asked a great question. Do I think Lord Chelmsford gets more stick than he deserves? Well, I guess if you're one of the dead people at Isandwana, you probably think he deserves all the stick he gets. But but um, but some of them won't have, actually, because they've just said, you know, sometimes your number's up in, in a battle. You know, it's got nothing to do specifically with the commander. I actually think he gets more of a stick than he, yeah, than he does deserve. Uh, I think there are some good reasons to... There's some good reasons why he divided his force. And it wasn't quite as reckless as some people think it was, um, all relative. And a lot of people put Lord Chelmsford's dividing his force at Isandwana and General Custer's conduct at Little Bighorn and sort of say, you know, Chelmsford is the British General Custer or General Custer is the American Lord Chelmsford. I think they were very different. And the reasoning behind their splitting their forces was very different as well. Uh, so I think he does get more stick than he... More stick than he deserves. However, he does deserve stick. Um, that's my that's my thoughts on it for what it's worth, uh, Lionheart. Okay. Um, a couple of other questions. So uh, let's uh, crack in to our first. Oh, uh, by the way, just uh, no, no. Well, I just let's get crack into our first story. Okay, uh, the Synod of Whitby, twelfth of April, six sixty four. Now, most of you know Whitby, if you know Whitby at all, as a lovely little um, fishing village uh, uh, on the, the North Yorkshire coast of the North Sea, home, of course, of Captain James Cook. And above it, you have Whitby Abbey. Whitby Abbey, that was um, Bram Stoker, famously uh, wrote uh, part of uh, Dracula there. And... Uh, Whitby Abbey was also was shelled during the First World War by the Germans. There was a, a German raid, a, a German naval raid on the east coast of England. Um, this is before aircraft and bombing campaigns. 1914, they actually uh, shelled, uh, naval ship shelled um, uh, Scarborough, Whitby, Hartlepool. Might have been Redcar as well, I'm not sure about that. But um, certainly those, those first three. And um, so, you know, Whitby, otherwise, lovely little town, good fish and chips. Synod of Whitby, a religious convention. You're thinking, oh God, give me the Windrush or, or Lord Chelmsford in San Juana any day. Probably one of the great dates in English history because it brought the English church, Christianity, into the sphere of Rome. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a backstory as to what on earth the, the Synod of Whitby was all about, okay? 
as you probably know, Anglo, the, the Angles, Saxons, Jutes rocked up in, in Britain, on the east and south coast of Britain, uh, at the end of the Roman Empire, or after the Roman Empire, after the Romans had sort of taken their legions away. And over time, over the next sort of 250 years, they slowly moved westwards and uh, they established kingdoms in their own right. Uh, the big ones, the big ones at the time in, in 664, we had uh, Wessex, we had Sussex, we had Kent, we had Essex. Um, I've just messed one up. Oh, Sussex are gone, sorry. Uh, we had uh, Kent, Wessex, East Anglia, um, Mercia, Essex, and Northumbria. Northumbria was covered the area of not only Northumbria now, northeast England, Newcastle, and up to the Scottish border, but down as far as, well, including Leeds. So it's basically Yorkshire and the northeast of England. A big, big kingdom. Um, so we had these Anglo and Saxon kingdoms. To the west, we still had the surviving Bretonic kingdoms of Cornwall, uh, a variety of kingdoms in what's now Wales. Uh, we just finished the Kingdom of Reged had finally gone. Uh, it was like Cumbria, now finally fallen to the to the Northumbrians, uh, and of course up in Scotland, um, the 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 ancient Britons, the Celts was still still in existence up there. And they had their own kingdoms as well. There was not a Scotland at this time. We had the Picts, uh, we had Godolphin, um, and we had Daira, and we had Strathclyde. So, you know, there a variety. So what you had, Britain was this ha hatch, you know, patchwork of kingdoms, some British, Romano-British, some Anglo-Saxon. The Romano-British kingdoms had uh, kept Christianity from the Roman Empire's time. time. It had sort of, it had petered out a bit, and this is this amazing bit that uh, some Irish uh, Irish pirates at the fall of the Roman Empire uh, captured a young man from Wales, took him over to Ireland, that's St. Patrick. And St. Patrick was instrumental in establishing Christianity in Ireland. In somewhat of a reverse move, Irish missionaries then came back to Britain in the Dark Ages to, uh, to, 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 preach, to preach the gospel. And they principally founded their base at Iona on the west coast of Scotland. And that's what became known as the Celtic Church. So the Celtic crosses that we see in places like Scotland and that sort of thing, and Ireland certainly, that's the Celtic Church. And they sort of adhered to a Christianity and the rules of Christianity as they had originally been established in the very, very early days of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Rome had moved on since then. And had now adopted since and, and, and studied, they drifted apart. Didn't have a lot of contact at all and was now prevalent on the European mainland. And in the, in the meantime, several things had changed, in particular, the date of Easter. The Originally, Easter in the Christian church coincided with Passover in the Jewish religion. And if you know your New Testament, you'll see why it coincided with, with Passover, of course, um, because, of course, you know, Last Supper was, was a Passover supper. So um, that's how the original church started. At the Council of Nicaea, uh, Nicaea in um, 325, the Roman Catholic Church or the Roman Church had established a new tradition that Easter would fall on a Sunday, would always be celebrated on a Sunday. And that, would you believe, was one of the two major differences between the Roman Church and the Celtic British Church. The Celtic British Church was in the bits of what we call Romano-Britain. The Anglo-Saxon kingdoms hadn't done Christianity. And eventually they were converted, and they were converted by Roman missionaries from Rome. Up in Northumbria, Northumbria was a strange place, because if you think about it geographically, where it was, it's right up on the, on the Scottish border. Northumbria had actually been converted to Christianity, not by Roman missionaries, but by missionaries from uh, uh, missionaries from Iona. So originally, Northumbria was was Celtic was a Celtic Christian church. By six sixty four, there was a bit of a split happening in Northumbria. The king, King Oswy, was uh, yeah he he was Celtic church, and his wife was. Roman church. And so we actually had this incredible thing in the court in Northumbria 
where they'd celebrate half the court would celebrate Easter at one time of the year and the other half of the court would celebrate at another time, including the king and his and his and his queen. So that's a backstory. There was a lot more going on to it than that. Uh, the, 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 the two churches are very, very different. The Celtic church, very, uh, very centered around bishops, very centered around monasteries and not particularly interested in power. The Roman Church, as anyone who knows anything about the Roman Catholic Church through the Middle Ages knows, it was all about the power and uh, bishops and the place of bishops. The, Rome, the, the Celtic Church fundamentally didn't, didn't really, bishops weren't held in much regard. It was the monastery that was important. In the Roman Church, it was all about the bishop. And bishops didn't tend to come from monasteries. They had their own, they were the bishop of, you know, bishop of wherever, Paris or whatever. So big difference there. The Celtic priests could marry, Roman priests couldn't. Celtic priests or Celtic monks cut their hair in a totally different way to the traditional friar, friar tuck uh, thing of, of the Roman church. So a lot of differences and a lot of power struggle going on in Britain. Britain was almost, you know, at this, this crossroads and Rome saw it very much as this, you know, e either Britain and these Anglo-Saxon kingdoms are only just converting to Christianity. They could go. They could go with this this ancient sect of Christianity, the Celtic Celtic churches, or they could come into our orbit. So there was a lot of power play going on here, and of course the power play was happening very much in the Northumbrian court. You know, he was getting it in the ear both from uh, Oswy was getting it in the ear from his missus uh, and her her chaplain, a man called um, oh, oh, uh, Wilfred. And also his son, his son was a Roman Catholic or Roman, they didn't call themselves Roman Catholics per se at this time, but uh, he was he was of the Roman tradition. Oswy was of the Celtic tradition. So the, this power struggle was being played out in, in, the, in the royal court of Northumbria. And eventually Oswy decided to hold a synod to try and decide which Easter date in particular they would go with and therefore which, which of the two churches was in the ascendancy in Northumbria. He held it at the Abbey of, uh, or the, uh, the Abbey at, at Whitby, and hence it was the Synod of Whitby. And he sat in judgment. He was going to be, you know, it's, it's rather like, you know, um, you know, Britain's Got Talent or something like that. He sat there like Simon Cowell, and uh, the two sides had to give their, their theological reasons as to, you know, why they were the right way and why Northumbria should go one way or the other. The... The Northumbrian Church was represented by represented by the leading light, uh, the the bishop from uh, Lindisfarne, uh, sorry, the the, the, the abbot of, of Lindisfarne, uh, Bishop Coleman. He was also Abbas Hilda, who was uh, interesting, female, and she was one of the leading lights in the British, the the Celtic Church in Northern Britain, um, and uh, Abbas Hilda. So we had these two, both based in Northumbria, both speaking the lingo. And against them was the Roman. The Romans had sent their best man, uh, a boat called uh, Bishop Ugglebert. Um, Ugglebert came from Francia, France. Couldn't speak a word of English or Anglo-Saxon. Um, couldn't speak any of the British language either, for that matter. He couldn't, you know, couldn't converse with the Kingdom of Strathclyde or any of that mob either. So, um, and he was basically having to have an interpreter. So. The Celtic Church felt they were on a winner. And don't forget, the judge, the Simon Cowell, King Oswy of uh, Northumbria, was uh, a, a Celtic Christian. And then entered a chaplain, Wilfred. Wilfred was from Mercia. He absolutely was a Roman supporter. And he basically, to a certain extent, pushed uh, the, the, French, the French bishop out of the way and he presented the case. And of course, suddenly now he was a Mercian. He spoke Anglo-Saxon. Uh, he could present his case every well as every bit as good as uh, the, the Celtic guys. And of course, he could counter their arguments. And basically, he argued that um, that that the Roman Church was the correct church to follow because Peter and Paul had both gone to Rome. This was the place where Christ's apostles had been not just gone, but had been martyred as well. And therefore the power was in Rome. God, God looked favorably on Rome. 
He also said that actually uh, most of Europe is following the Roman tradition here, including the rules on Easter. Uh, not only Europe, there was a significant church in those days in Egypt, in Alexandria. And he said, you know, actually, even Alexandria. So most of the known world, or, you know, we're talking Anglo-Saxon known world, was supporting the Roman church. And in, in the end, Oswe decided to go with the Roman uh, argument and Wilfred's argument. And that's when the, well, the, the Northumbrian church and the rest of the Anglo-Saxons came into line behind Northumbria. Northumbria was the main power player at this time in, in Anglo-Saxon England. And um, uh, that's where basically the Celtic church went into retreat. Uh, Bishop Coleman went off to Iona on the west coast of Scotland. And the Celtic church really, uh, it, it survived a bit in, in parts of Scotland and Wales and, and, and Ireland until the 11th century, beginning of the 12th century. And by then it, it got consumed into, into the Roman Catholic uh, uh, faith. But from that date on, from the Synod of Whitby, the English church came into the Roman Catholic and would remain so until Henry VIII's time. So this was the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church holding sway in England. Uh, obviously, the, the, the date changed for Easter. Uh, monks from now on would cut their hair like Friar Tuck. OK, and. Um, as I say, I, uh, the, 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 the Celtic Church went into decline. Interestingly, in the Reformation, Henry VIII's time and beyond, they actually said that this was the moment that they, they actually praised the uh, Celtic Church because it was British and the Roman Catholic Church was a bit like an, an EU. And therefore, you know, back in the day, things were good when the when the Celtic Church. So the Celtic Church got a never was never revived, but uh, suddenly became sort of like a very acceptable in and, and praised during the Reformation, because, of course, they'd have tried to hold out against Rome for totally different reasons to Henry VIII. Um, Oswe would uh, get, remain king for another seven years. In fact, he would, uh, he, 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 he sort of cemented his position. In fact, he'd cemented his position about 10 years before the Synod of Whitby when he had defeated the Mercians, the last great pagan Mercian king, uh, Penda. What a great name, eh? Penda. Uh, Penda, the scourge of the Northumbrians, but was finally defeated at the Battle of Winwade, which was near Leeds in six, uh, 655. Great story. Love to tell the story of Penda. Uh, and indeed, they believe that previously Penda had given the Northumbrians a right bashing and had been given, taken a lot of gold from them. And they believe a lot of that gold could be what's in the, the famous Staffordshire hoard that was found about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, they think that could be part of Penda's gold that he was bringing back from, from uh, Northumbria. As I say, Oswe died in, in 670, and there you go. That's uh, the Synod of Whitby. So probably more significant, if you think about then, the development of the church and monasteries and monastic power in England from then on into the Middle Ages, uh, then maybe then we give it credit for. And why we don't celebrate Easter at the same time as Passover. There you go. Don't know if you found that interesting, bit different. Uh, please put a comment in if you haven't. Uh, Let me quickly, uh, quickly look. <laughs> Uncle Heavy, you, uh, your Whitby connection was Dracula. That's fantastic. Uh, and now you're going into puerile, puerile comments. Just sorry, just reading all your comments there. Well, Christopher Warren, you're from Stoke-on-Trent, and you would know, hopefully, the Staffordshire Hoard, because part of it is on display at Stoke-on-Trent. Great display. Anyone who's going, to, going anywhere near Stoke, go into the Stoke-on-Trent, the Potteries Museum at Stoke-on-Trent. Great display of the Staffordshire Hoard. Not all of it. Some of it's down in Birmingham, but the Birmingham Museum at the minute is uh, going through some refurbishments. So it's not open to the public. Um, and Jen, yeah, you're absolutely right. Religion can be so peculiar over the details. And gosh, people fight over them, don't they, sometimes? Didn't result in war here in this case, okay? So there we go. That's, um, that is the Synod of Whitby. 
bit different to uh, the Empire Windrush, a bit different to my normal talks about battles as well. Got another couple of events coming up for you in a moment, okay? So um, let me, uh, just, just a quick one, just a thank you to all of you, because I can see several of you who are members of my uh, supporters club. So thank you very much indeed. QA Library, Charlie Manson, Leslie, uh, Leslie. Uh, Jen, you're, of course, you're a patron. So thank you very much in that as well for that. Um, you can become a patron over on my website. Otherwise, you can become a member of my history channel here on YouTube by clicking the join button below. And I'm going to be doing more of these live talks just for members, uh, some exclusive videos just for members. And indeed, we're going to be uh, talking. Uh, I involve members a lot of the time in looking at whatever what my next subject should be and indeed, you know, what thumbnails I should use and things like that. So you're you're part of how I shape my YouTube channel. Thank you very much indeed for your support. So let's just talk Dick Turpin. Dick Turpin was hanged in York on the 7th of April, 1739. Um, he was born in Essex in 1705, uh, son of a butcher. He learned his uh, butchery trade, but then he seemed to exchange that for poaching. Became quite a, he joined a gang of poachers. Poaching was big and especially around Epping Forest. At the time, Epping Forest was still an enclosed forest. You weren't supposed to poach there, um, but uh, people did. In fact, I actually read, I, I was reading in my research that uh, it, part of it, they actually, it was so prevalent in Epping Forest that they passed a law in Parliament called the Black Act. And the Black Act was it was against the law to blacken your face at night and go anywhere near Epping Forest because it's pretty obvious what you're up to, wasn't it? So this Black Act was basically, it was a criminal offence to camouflage yourself before going on your poaching trip. Um, joined a, a gang of uh, well, a gang of poachers who then then became uh, basically cutthroats, uh, robbers, uh, called the, uh, the Gregory Gang, also known as the Essex Gang. Whilst Essex and Epping Forest was their, their main haunt, uh, they went quite far afield. They were at, at different stages. Uh, they were certainly down uh, on, uh, I reckon it was the Wimbledon area. Actually, someone was talking about high women from Wimbledon. Wimbledon, Sheen, uh, that sort of area. Uh, where else? Charlton in South London. They, they, they went over the river. They also were very active around the north of London, in, even in places like Hoburn. Uh, certainly in place, uh, place like Leytonstone, very much part of London now, but countryside in those days. So um, eventually, uh, eventually the Gregory gang were all sort of rounded up. They were a major menace and were slowly captured. Uh, several were hung at Tyburn and their bodies were then put in gibbets and displayed on the Edgware Road, which is yeah, quite fun to think the Edgware Road now. It was busy thoroughfare through London and uh, right by Marble Arch, and to think that people were being hanged there and then their bodies put in gibbets along, along the A5 uh, Edgeway Road. It was around then, 1735, that he, Dick Turpin seemed to take up becoming a highwayman. Highwayman, uh, romantic image, isn't it? Gentlemen highwaymen, people like Claude Duval. But uh, Turpin was D Turpin was basically a thug. <laughs> and, uh, there was no finer way of putting it. High women robbed people, and you know, if you didn't give them what they wanted, they were likely to dust you up. Uh, this, this Claude Duval famously danced with a lady, um, as her sort of rather than rob her, but um, and that was back in, in King Charles II's time in the 1660s, 1670s. But by now, we're talking 1730s, and Dick Turpin most certainly was quite frankly a, a, a thug. Uh, he, um, he attacked people, he certainly uh, cut people's faces. And um, he was d doing his highwayman stuff again around the north side of London, Essex, but as far afield as Winchester, down in, in Hampshire as well. There are reports of Dick Turpin being down there. Eventually, he shot a man in 1737, so two years into his highwayman career, and had to do a runner from Essex. He shot a man near Epping Forest. A 200 pound reward was put on his head. So he disappeared and he sort of moved via Lincolnshire to um to to yorkshire where he became a horse trader except people became highly suspicious about exactly how he was obtaining his horses and <laughs> back in queen elizabeth's first time horse stealing had been become been made a capital offense and remained so until the 1730s and he was arrested for horse stealing and this is where one of those great moments comes in he was arrested for horse stealing 
he wrote to his brother-in-law down in Essex. In those days, we talked about the Penny Post and Roland Hill a few weeks ago, but in those days, if you sent a letter, the receiver paid for it. You didn't put a stamp on it and pay yourself, the receiver. So his brother-in-law said, well, I don't know anyone in York and it's a bloody expensive letter that, from York. So no, I don't want to accept it. I don't want to pay for it. So it got given to the postmaster in Saffron Warden on the wait, Essex, Essex Hertfordshire border. And here's one of those classic moments of fate. The, the postmaster at Saffron Warden had taught Dick Turpin how to write. The letter was actually, and he recognised the handwriting. Uh, the letter was actually up in, uh, from York, was actually from a man called uh, uh, Robert Palmer. But that was just an alias that Turpin was using. And of course, Posty down in Sa uh, Saffron Warden announced that uh, this isn't, you know, it's not Robert Palmer you've got him, you're in custody up there. It's the famous highwayman, Dick Turpin, who's got a 200 quid price on his head. So uh, he collected, um, and actually, I'm not sure if Posty did get the reward. I think he did. But, um, but he testified against, uh, against Turpin. Turpin was put on trial at York and was hanged. But he was actually hanged for horse theft, not for the murder down in Epping Forest. But, uh, um, and he was hanged on the 7th of April, 1739. Supposedly, his body was actually exhumed from its grave by gravediggers. Um, it was recovered by a mob who already started to think of Dick Turpin as a bit of a hero and was reburied. But um, and the, the, the Turpin became this legend. A legend started almost immediately. There were pamphlets about Dick Turpin, uh, but it really became a legend and became he became the sort of the, the numeral uno uh, highwayman in British history in the 1830s when uh, a book called Rock, uh, Rookwood was published. And in Rookwood, Turpin suddenly was transformed from a, a thug to this sort of romantic character. And the real moment in the book is when he's fleeing from uh, fleeing from the authorities, which to you and I would be fleeing from justice, uh, fleeing from the authorities. He mounted his horse called Black Bess and rode 200 miles through the night to York. And it, there in the sight of York, Black Bess finally collapsed and uh, and he was he was captured uh, sitting by his dead horse, who he loved dearly. Uh, well, interesting enough, there was no horse called Black Bess, certainly not one owned by Dick Turpin. Dick Turpin did not ride 200 miles to York from Epping. Uh, as I said, he took he took several years to make his way up through through Lincolnshire, uh, robbing people on the on the Great North Road, the A1 now, and finally rocking up in, in Yorkshire as a horse trader. So not quite how Rookwood would have it out. But that sounds like a much more better story, doesn't it? So there we go. He became this legendary character. Since then, there's been a couple of uh, there's been a couple of uh, attempts to see if a horse could seriously run 200 miles to uh, through the night. Physically impossible. Horse can't do it. it collapsed long, long before long before it got anywhere near York. Of course, it um, it's brought various films, including great uh, TV series, tail end of the 70s, early 80s, with Richard O'Sullivan, Dick Turpin. It was on ITV, ITN, ITV, sorry, um, at the time. And um, yeah, that was, I remember that one. And you might also remember 19, uh, 1974 film, Carry On Dick. Yep. Sid James as, as Dick Turpin. Uh, that really takes him from hoodlum to legend to Sid James with his na naughty laugh. Can't get better than that, can you? So there you go, folks. A couple of events from British history this week. I hope you've enjoyed them. I was going to tell you, about, I'll tell you one last one just to finish us off, okay? I'm going to tell you about Lord Simon Fraser Lovett. He was executed at Tower Hill, beheaded at Tower Hill on the 9th of April, 1747. He was a Jacobite supporter, supporter of Bonnie Prince Charlie. That's why he was executed. Uh, he was actually 80 years old. He was a wily old fox, uh, was was um, uh, Lord Simon Fraser Lovett, uh, and and uh, and a man who, who he was the great survivor. In 1703, he'd uh, he'd uh, come to Scotland uh, for a, on a Jacobite cause to raise a Jacobite rebellion, which he promptly betrayed to the government in return for some lands and titles. When he then went back to France, strange enough, the, the, uh, the Stuarts weren't very happy and uh, they, he, they managed to get the French to imprison him for 10 years. 
he received a, he finally was let out in 1714 he went back to scotland where he now got a pardon from uh, from from uh, the, the the government authorities later that year having just received the pardon bonnie prince charlie lands in scotland he encourages his son to join bonnie prince charlie whilst he professed uh, loyalty to king J uh, king george ii so he had a foot in both camps wily old fox when bonnie prince charlie won at battle of preston pans just outside edinburgh lord lovett decided he knew which way the wind was blowing and he threw in his lot with bonnie prince charlie bad move because the following year uh, bonnie prince charlie was in headlong retreat from the government forces ends up up at culloden and is defeated at the battle of culloden which by the way folks is next week in history and uh, at that stage, Lord Lovett, the man who'd been you know, flip-flopping backwards and forwards, urges Bonnie Prince Charlie to stay in Scotland and keep fighting. Bonnie Prince Charlie thinks you can forget that idea, and off he went. And Lord Lovett was captured and brought to London. Aged 80, put on trial, sentenced to, sentenced to death, to beheading. Massive um, press coverage, I guess you'd call it in those days. Huge crowds, thousands of people came to Tower Hill to see him beheaded just outside Tower of London. And um, they, in fact, they even had scaffolding erected. So many people wanted to come. They erected scaffolding for people to have a bird's eye view and people could pay to go on the scaffolding and look. And it so happened as he was being brought there to, onto Tower Hill and being brought to the scaffold that uh, part of the scaffolding collapsed and nine people were killed. I mean, this is ironic, isn't it? You go to see someone being beheaded and you end up being a victim yourself. And Lord Lovett thought it was hilarious. He saw the ironic and funny side of it, even though he was about to lose his head. And uh, he went up on the scaffolding. And supposedly, he was still laughing about the, the, whole, the whole bizarre situation as the axeman brought his axe down, which gave rise to the expression, laughing your head off. And with that, folks, I think that's a good time to leave you this evening, uh, this evening, this afternoon, this evening for one or two of you, possibly, uh, uh, this week. Just touch up, uh, look at, um, to see what some of the else, uh, what we're saying. There's a fair bit there about the, about the high women. Should I do a story? Should I do a video about high women at some time? Would that would that be a good one to do? Do you think the history of history of British high women? Uh, I mean, there's some great stories, great stories about Turpin, um, Claude Claude Duval. Great one. A couple of other gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, high women from King Charles II's time. How about um, her Lady Ferris, the wicked lady? Um, she, she, again, highway woman, uh, just to prove that anyone can be a highway man or woman if you want to. Uh, there's also the story of uh, Robert Snook, um, one of the last men to be convicted of, of being a high woman, but highly suspicious uh, whether he actually was a high woman or whether he was a bit of a Walter Mitty pretending he was a high woman and ended up swinging for it, which is a really rubbish way to end your life, really, I suppose. Lots of yes pleases. Thank you very much. OK, that's sounding like a bit of an endorsement. Um, so there you go, folks. Wicked Lady says Invisible Ray. Yeah, the film, of course, Wicked Lady. Also, pub, where I was brought up, Wheat Hampstead in Hertfordshire, uh, the Wicked Lady pub. Named in her honour, she lived up to Markiate in Hertfordshire. Anyone who knows Hertfordshire, that's where she, uh, well, that's where she was found dead from a gunshot. Anyway, that's that's a spoiler. I can't tell you anymore just in case I do the video. How about that? So, um, so thank you very much indeed, everyone, for joining me today. Thanks for all your support. Please do look up the this week's videos if you haven't seen them already about the HMS HMS uh, Birkenhead disaster, which gave rise to the uh, maritime procedure of women and children first in maritime disasters. And also the forgotten story of Empire Windrush, which is known in British history for the Windrush generation, Tilbury 1948, West Indian immigrants arriving in Britain. Would you believe in 25 years, that was the only journey she ever made to the Caribbean. And in the meantime, her story was British troop ship taking the glorious Gloucesters to the Korean War. Uh, she took part in the Spithead Review, the Queen's Coronation Spithead Review, Naval Review in 1953. 325 ships were involved in the Spithead Review. 197 Royal Navy warships. I mean, seriously, have we got 197 anymore at all? In any size? I don't know. Uh, but there were some merchant 
naval vessels there as well in the review. And would you believe Empire Windrush was one of them? I mean, we never hear that story, do we? And nor do we hear the story that she was never a British ship in the first place. She was a German ship built in Hamburg, 1930. She actually spent the 1930s taking, or two things actually, taking German immigrants to South America. Oh well, yes, but not, not the Nazis. This is prior to then. Uh, German immigrants to South America, somewhat ironic. Then she then brought Caribbean immigrants to Britain. Uh, and then she was actually involved in the Strength, strength Through Joy uh, Nazi program of cheap holidays for working class Germans. Cruise ship going around Norway, Baltic, that sort of area. Um, and then she ends up as a troop ship for the Germans in the Second World War. She ends up being a Holocaust ship. And she then ends up finally being in British hands, principally as a troop ship, with one journey not as a troop ship, the one that she's famous for. So much more of a story. Uh, almost like a, you know, she got this one starring role, and then she's like a, a walk-on character in so many other stories. As I say, including transporting the glorious Gloucesters, Gloucestershire Regiment to the Korean War, where they fought at the Battle of Imjin River. Uh, which I've got a video about, one of my most popular videos. So check that out. If you want to know about the British in the Korean War, check out my video on uh, the Glorious Gloucesters. Uh, Gloucesters, were, they were called the Glorious Gloucesters by the Americans. So they actually, it's G-L-O-S-T-E-R-S, -E Gloucesters. Uh, but the Glorious Gloucesters, and of course, the Glorious Gloucesters had a real soft spot for this weird transport ship. Because, of course, the Windrush is a river that rises in the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire in their native county. So there you go, folks. Uh, you probably don't need to watch it now, do you? You've heard it all. So have a great weekend. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your support. Keep well. Next week, we've got um, videos about Jack Harrison, the Rugby League Victoria Cross recipient in the First World War, and the British Gurkha Wars, when the British fought the Gurkhas. That's next week. A week in which we also have the Titanic sinking, we have uh, the Spithead mutiny during the Napoleonic Wars, and we have the Battle of Culloden. See you next Friday, if not before. Have a great weekend.